Hey there, folks. This is Casey, host of the Nerdy Photographer Podcast. Just a heads up, while this episode deals with AI and AI generative art and AI used in uh, editing software for photography, uh, this was recorded a little while ago. And since then, there's just been like huge, you know, stories coming out. Like there's the new version of Mid Journey has come out where it's creating super photorealistic images and the hands and limbs and things are looking more real. Uh, Adobe has announced Firefly there and it's in beta, their new AI generative art app. And, uh, you know, Levi's just announced uh, yesterday as I'm uh, getting ready to record this, that they are uh, going to be using AI generated models to increase diversity in their photo campaigns. So a lot is happening. This, this, this subject is just evolving every, every day. And, but I think that the topics that we cover in this episode are evergreen. They are going to be something that we're always going to be talking about when it comes to artificial intelligence and photography. So that being said, I hope you enjoy this episode. So what's the answer? Forty-two. <laughs> Very funny, but I'm sure you know that the parameters of my query make that an invalid answer. Oh, hey, welcome to the Nerdy Photographer Podcast. I'm your host, Casey Fatchett. If you've never listened to the podcast before, in addition to sharing entertaining and informative photography and business-related content, I also go on missions with the crew of the Starship Fibonacci. While you're here, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. You don't want to miss out on future adventures. Right now, I'm having a conversation with an artificial intelligence named JCN. I prefer the name Jason. Hey, whatever floats your code, bro. And on this episode of the Nerdy Photographer Podcast, Jared Poitier from the Photo Friends Podcast is back, and we are discussing AI and its use in the photography industry, from services that can be used for culling and editing to how AI is already integrated into some photo editing software and much more. Stick around for that conversation after the break. Have you rethought your answer, JCN? I'm sticking with 42. Yeah, I'm not sure how to interpret that as the best recipe for guacamole. Hey, photographers. Are you tired of using the same stale poses with your clients, resulting in stiff and unnatural photos? Consider using Let's Be Real prompts instead. Prompts are not just a list of poses. They're designed to help you create a more engaging, fun environment for your photo subjects, resulting in more natural and authentic images. With Nerdy Photographer's Let's Be Real prompts, you'll have a unique set of prompts for couples, weddings, families, and individuals, ensuring that you never run out of ideas. Prompts are particularly helpful for clients who are nervous or self-conscious about having their picture taken. By giving them something else to focus on, they can become more relaxed and their reactions will be more authentic and less guarded. Using Let's Be Real prompts will not only help you create more fresh and dynamic images, but it will also increase your confidence and your client's confidence in you. You'll be able to handle difficult situations and subjects with ease, resulting in more satisfied clients and a stronger photography business. So start using Let's Be Real prompts from the Nerdy Photographer today and elevate your photography to the next level. Go to nerdyphotographer.com and go to our store or click the link in the episode notes and get started creating authentic, engaging images today. Welcome to the Nerdy Photographer podcast. I am your host, Casey Fatchett, and I am here today with our photo friend, the host of the Photo Friends podcast, Jared Poirier. Welcome. Amazing. Amazing. Great, great pronunciation on there. Very, pr very proper. I could have done Poirier. Even better, even <laughs> better, Casey. Your name is really easy to say, but I could put some French uh, spin on it as well. People, Casey, I don't know. <laughs> the the, the uh, people always want to add either an E or an I to the end of my last name. So it's mm. either Fichetti or I think it's Fiché. Machete uh, sounds uh, like a, a nice, uh, like a shaved meat you'd put on a pizza. Yes. It sounds like a, you know, some sort of soppressata or facchetti. Put some facchetti. It may be a cheese. It could be a cheese. You're, you're really making me hungry right now, but I haven't. <laughs> I can't eat cheese anymore. Um, oh, no. Unfortunately, I found out since the last time we talked, I found out that I'm horribly lactose intolerant. Um oh. Which apparently has been going on well, for decades, and I didn't that know. That doesn't mean you can't eat cheese. It just means you're going to suffer. <laughs> Shouldn't eat yeah. cheese. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> um, before we get into our main discussion, we are going to do our dice breaker for the episode. 
Oh, nice. I'm excited for that. It is. It's a seven, uh, which means uh, let's hear your uh, most uh, entertaining uh, or fun photo shoot that you've been on. Uh, the most entertaining ever. Um, shit, I could We're probably most- do a few different ones here, but one, one that I had a lot of fun on one recent one, I actually had uh, the opportunity to shoot a magazine cover for like a Canadian, uh, magazine here that does a lot of like food and beverage stuff. Uh, and I'm still, uh, close friends with the guy, Joe Friday. I met him, uh, on that photo shoot and we became close friends. I really like, uh, the concept, like he came up with a very artsy concept for the photo shoot where he was all dressed like a cowboy, but like very proper, all the surroundings was like very proper, but he was just eating a burger and he had like a girl come over and like pour his scotch and like wipe his lip and stuff like that. So it was a whole, it was a whole thing, man. It was a very like artsy and uh, creative kind of idea that he had. Uh, and uh, he's black as well. Like, and he's from uh, the States, like, um, I feel like I've heard the name Tennessee before or something like that. And, uh, yeah, so he was kind of like the idea was like subverting the, the concept of like a Southern gentleman or whatever, kind of like reincorporating it, I suppose, whatever. Anyways, nice. I thought it was a cool and like artsy concept that he had and really fun shoot, man. And, uh, still, still hang out with the guy. We still do work together and get beers together and stuff like that. So that's cool, man. I'll, I'll go with that one. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's a cover shoot. It's always like, you know, combining things that you, you find. Like you're finding all of the sorts of, you know, the things that you, the creative aspect of it. Plus it's also, you know, like this exposure of a way, like, you know, it's going to be on the cover Definitely. of print. It's in print it any, yeah, it yeah. print anymore. Um, <laughs> it's at least a flex, right? You yeah. can say that I've shot magazine covers. So, oh, yeah. Man, there's a, that's a discussion. I, I don't know if you follow Rob Hall at all, but in one of our episodes that we did, we talked about like the tropes of the photography industry. One was like, you know, Instagram, uh, bios or profile, like thing where people are like, I've been published and blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know, like the fact that you can it, it pay to be published in things, <laughs> uh, has kind of brought down some of the credulity of that. So it's like, you know, yeah. like saying I'm published in this where it was actually published and I didn't pay to be, you know, you don't get, you don't pay to be the cover sh- shot of yeah, yeah. usually, um, so our conversation today uh, is about artificial intelligence and AI editing and various other uh, aspects of artificial intelligence in photography. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had talked a little bit about this and you said, you know, like, I don't really uh, uh, use that. But then you wrote me back like, oh, wait, I have been actually finding elements of AI in other things. And one of the things that I mentioned is like, you know, this stuff has just sort of been incorporated into Mm -hmm. Adobe products without you noticing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not something that I really went and sought out and was like, Oh, this new, like these AI tools, I better download them and integrate them into my workflow. It's more like I use these Adobe things, (laughs) Premiere and uh, Lightroom, Photoshop. Right. And in order to, I guess, try to make the user experience a little bit better, or maybe, you know, stay ahead of the competition or whatever, they've started integrating these things. And yeah, like you said, it's just been like kind of seamlessly integrated to where I haven't even noticed. Um, And I do think this is an amazing topic, man. Like, let me just give uh, kudos to you. Like, (laughs) (laughs) I think it's, uh, it's pretty cutting edge and, you know, like uh, an important thing to discuss on a photography podcast. So thank you for inviting me. No problem. And you're always welcome. The, yeah, I mean, I thought that it's just like the prevalence of there's, I think the artwork part of it has become more in our faces. Yeah. Recently, but yeah, like these little things, in like it's sort of in the background like you're saying like uh, it's it's been incorporated seamlessly into adobe editing stuff that you just didn't realize that that was actually ai but that's what i can't remember what they refer to their robot that runs they run things behind the scenes Hmm. um but they come out with these projects and they have been for a while that i've found very interesting and i'm like oh this is they don't there's only a few things they have like their neural network filters which is like a specifically ai run like you have to be connected to the internet and it has to go through to like them them, that is that's specifically uh ai run but all these other things that they've developed like content aware fill and things like that um but there was one that was that they showed at uh photoshop world or whatever that thing is the expo 
that they do that uh, w- that I'm when is it going to happen? There's this thing called moving pictures. And it was like they could give you a they, they would take a still photo mm. and it would turn it into a like five second video. Pan, it would create a 3D map and they'd do like a five second like panning video. It could pan up or I could pan pan up and down or side to side. And looking at um like landscapes of like shots with it was incredible. Like yeah. I I would have thought it was a drone shot. Like you'd you'd have these photos and it'd just be like it, it was, you'd think it was video, but it was like when is that coming? Like that they I, they showed it like five years ago at Photo Expo or whatever it was, mm-hmm. Photoshop World, and then it hasn't like shown up yet. But it's like I, there are things that like take a little while, or they may have just realized it takes way too much processing power for it to be practical for everybody. But I was like, that's amazing. That would be like fantastic for your reels or whatever. Just like you can just take your static still shot and turn it into, you know, a little video, like a panning video. Yeah. Anything to spend less time making reels, man. Yes. <laughs> anything, anything yeah. to do less reels, like less time devoted to that. Um, but yeah, there's also like the, the thing is like, I also use a few different editing softwares, not regularly, but like as part of, you know, this thing, I, I sort of keep on the cusp of other programs and mm-hmm. like on one software has like started a new thing with, they have like AI filters, like specifically this is like, you can apply these different AI filters to your photos or you know, the editing, but they also have like AI retouching. Yeah. Um, which you can, you control like the parameters of it, but then it just like looks at the picture and it's like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do my thing. Um, <clears throat> more so and like there's a, another editing suite uh called luminar um they've got like all sorts of ai editing i think their new neo software i think it came out last year um has like all sorts of like landscape ais it'll remove um telephone wires or you know like from photos you know all sorts of like different like types of things you just like click on oh, i want to remove this and I want to like this in my photo and it just analyzes the picture and like edits it all together, like by, by itself, which is a little scary. Um, yeah, I, I gotta tell you though, it, it is cool on my phone. Like, uh, with the, the Google pixel, I took a photo of, uh, of my dog running in the snow. Right. And uh, I had actually, um, what, what do you call that? Pulling a, uh, game of Thrones where you leave the <laughs> Starbucks cup <laughs> yes. in the shot fully did that, you know? Uh, and then, you know, back in the day, I would have had to pull that into Photoshop, grab the clone tool and clone that out. I can just do that shit, shit on my phone, man. I just like yeah. touched it with my finger. Starbucks cup was gone. It's a bit scary, but at the same time, it is cool. And you can do like the sky replacement and stuff like that as well. Maybe not on your phone, but uh, uh, yeah, you can. And yeah. in some in some apps, it's not the quality. It, it looks good in a phone. Yeah, it wouldn't yeah. look good in print. But like you know, the way that we're they're doing, like that Adobe has just into Lightroom. I mean, like, the, like select subject or select sky or select background. Mm, so that you can make it it's like there's now just available in lightroom it it had been around for like a year or so the select subject had been around for a few years which i didn't realize was a possibility but now in like the last couple of years it has been because again artificial intelligence and how it's like learned to identify subjects uh is nuts like in just in, in in lightroom and being able to like go through for me in wedding photos to be like, Oh, I want to darken the background up a little bit. I want to like do this with a couple and just like swap between the masks of the background and the sky and the people. It's like with like that, it's just like a, you know, snap your fingers and it's done. It does not take, you know, it used to like, when they, they had like a select subject, it would take like a minute for Photoshop <laughs> to figure out what you were doing. And now it's like five seconds, maybe. And it's got them selected and it's got a pretty good selection uh, of the, uh, of the person or whoever it is. It's like, that's gotten pretty crazy. I, I just don't, I, I'm 
uh, in awe of that. And yes, it makes life easier. It is a little frightening in some ways what you see, what can be done, like face swapping people mm. or, um, we get into these sort of ethical questions of like deep fakes and like using AI to create like deep fake technology or there's a AI audio editing like thing that mm. can learn your voice and then recreate your voice with it has like a certain amount of like yeah. hear, listening to you speak. And, and, it, and you and I have been diligently creating reference <laughs> <laughs> for, for that stuff. Have hours and hours and reference, but James Earl Jones sold his voice to right. Disney. Right. They can just use like they they're using it to do Darth Vader for till until the end of time. Like they've yeah. got his voice. There's those ethical things like uh, imperson- impersonation and stuff like that. But then there's also, and we'll get into it later when we talk about kind of these like AI art apps and stuff like that. But the idea of like copyright and, and you Where's know, how are from? they sourcing the the data sets and that. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get really nerdy. We'll say data set, we'll, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we'll get into that in just a minute. But I think they, I've got a couple other things I wanted to discuss that are, For sure. that, that are more like applicable, I think, to everyday work as a photographer. And the first one I want to start with is culling. Like mm-hmm. the thing that I think is the biggest, I think the like time suck for a lot of photographers is like going through photos, especially like for weddings, stuff like, you know, shoot like 4,000 pictures, try to get it down to, you know, a deliverable amount. I'm not going to send people 4,000 photos. Um, but there's a company called after shoot and they, their tagline is make uh, photo culling made easy. Uh, and it just goes through and it selects, you know, the photos that it's going to pull out and, you know, <laughs> the, you get to select like what you get to see the selections that made. So if you don't want to like delete that photo, you don't have to, like you get to see what it did afterwards. Like you can review it, but it's like, this is $10 a month or $15 a month. If you, uh, it's 15 a month. If you, do it monthly American, $15 American and $10 a month American if you pay for it by the year. But it goes through and it like detects if like the people are out of focus, like if it's like severely under or overexposed, uh, duplicate photos. Um, mm. and you can select like the key faces. Like for example, if you were like, again, if it was a wedding and you're like, okay, my couple or my, key faces I want to like keep an eye on like they definitely need to be in focus and so like if it finds that their photos their their faces are out of focus it's you know tosses that picture um I don't know like I don't know what your thoughts on this are my thought on it is I haven't tried it yet and I'm really considering it is that for 10 bucks a month how much time do I spend calling like uh, he, that is the like most time I spend on the shoot. Like yeah. you know, is going through the photos afterwards, especially for weddings is going through yeah. afterwards and like trying to pick out photos. Um, I would, I would also say it's one of the least like creatively stimulating activities, yep. right? Like you do when I'm shooting, I feel, you know, like that kind of artist part of my brain is very activated. And then when I'm going through, you know, and changing like my presets and actually, you know, adjusting everything about the photo um, and making such creative decisions, like, do I want to just make it uh, kind of do like a teal and orange thing? Fuck it. I'll just make it black and white. You know, that's exciting. It's calling. More, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're more engaged at that point. Certainly. You, yeah. you, you know, it, like you're, there's something creative going on. Yeah. You're doing that. But whereas the culling, you're just sort of like, Ugh. and also like this gives you the option, like afterwards to like look over it and be like, okay, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't want to get rid of that photo. I want to keep that picture. Right. Or, uh, yeah. Like I made the joke recently on Instagram with a, like a meme. It was like, you know, when we're suddenly starting to keep, uh, out of focus pictures when blurry photos that, that like month or so where blurry photos were all the rage, uh, I don't know if that's still going on, but yeah, you know, it was like AI culling is going to just like freak out. Like what, what? I don't know if I'm supposed to keep photos that are totally out of focus now. Um, <laughs> you're doing this on purpose. Um, well, the, the next big thing is going to be photos where everyone's eyes are closed. Yeah, be great. <laughs> Everybody close your eyes. It's bird box. It's the bird box photo. There you go. Um, 
the, but yeah, I, I just think like cost wise, if you're somebody who does a lot of shooting, like, and you find that this, you can try it for free, but if you find that it works for you, yeah, then it can save you a lot of time. See, what I would be interested in is like how it actually works into the workflow that I have now. Like for me, it's always a big ask to add another program in there. Like yeah. I was saying, that's why I haven't really sought this stuff out in terms of like my actual workflow. It's the way that like AI tools have kind of gotten to, to me is more through updating the things that I already use. Like if Lightroom adds a freaking automatic culling, I'm going like, to be using that. Right? says one click import into Lightroom. Hmm. See? Hmm. Wow. Then yeah. Maybe. Yeah. And capture <laughs> one. So yeah, that's why I'm like, oh, I'm going to try this out. I can't really get less than one click. Can't yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it. All I got to do is push one button. All right. Okay. And that kind of leans into the, the other one. I mean, yeah. 10 bucks a month or 15 bucks a month, like getting my time back and spending, like I can spend money, many more hours doing my reels or doing things that get me paid, you know, like yeah, they get yeah. me paid that I'm, that I'm sacrificing at the most $15 a month. That right. That's, that's a serious consideration to make. The next one that I want to do is there are also AI editing, editing. Uh, there are AI editing softwares as well that will batch edit your photos. Mm-hmm. And one of them is Imogen, I am a G E N. I'm going to include links to all this stuff in the episode notes. Um, but this, you know, like they claim, you know, they'll give you a thousand free edits. And then it's like, depends on the size of the project. Um, and it's like five cents per photo, uh, with an extra th- cent for each for cropping and straightening so you can mm-hmm. get up like seven cents unless you're like doing like i think big, let's see no it's all five cents per photo that's just to uh, figure it out like what it's going to cost you um and apparently you need to send them like for this one in particular you need to send them a i think it's a thousand or three thousand edits that you've done like edited images so that it can learn your style, um, <laughs> which um, I don't know what your thoughts. I want to get your thoughts before I kind of go into like the experiences that I've heard from people on this. Yeah. So, you know, this one is a little bit less tempting for me personally. Like you, you may have, uh, you know, if listeners could hear my skeptical face, they would have <laughs> heard it. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just so hesitant to to use something like that, even though it does say it's learning your style. I just feel like then it's really taking the art aspect out of it quite a bit. And then it's kind of becoming more of an assembly line, which, you know, there are certain shoots, I guess you could do. Like if you were doing, let's just say shooting corporate parties, right? Was like the big thing that you did, like shooting corporate parties, then then maybe, right? But even with something like, uh, wedding photography, I'd want to be touching it myself. I'd want to be like the creator touches what's making this special. And I just feel like for me personally, it would be kind of like, I don't know. I, I'm not going to say it'd be like against my moral code as an artist or whatever. Like that's saying a lot to say that. Right. <laughs> but I, I would just say, yes, I'm very skeptical. And, you know, we, this is like a deeper conversation we can kind of talk about, but that, that line's going to be different for everybody, right? Like when has the line, cause I'll use uh AI generated um, like preset in Lightroom where Lightroom just looks at the photo and it's like, Oh, what do you think about this? And I'm like, that's cool. Let me adjust the contrast, a couple of things, change the colors. Boom. Right. That for me, that doesn't violate my sense of what's, what's okay. And what's not as, as an artist and a creator. So right. you're still have your, yeah. you're still involved in it yeah. and you're in the creative aspect of it. I, it to- yeah. I totally get that. And I, under- I agree with you. I think that, uh, from the stories that I've heard experiences with this, I haven't personally, I, I've seen like output because I asked before <laughs> I tried for myself, like I wanted to see what people said about it. And 
Um, the problem is if you have sort of like mixed lighting conditions, which is especially happens at events. Yeah. Um, you can end up with like colors that are way off because it just doesn't like, it doesn't know to edit it certain things like it could get it could kind of get the basic like look of your style if you have a particular yeah. like preset that you use it kind of gets the the sense of that but then when it's like applying it to oh there's like some sort of color in the background like in the lighting even if it's not on the subjects themselves like but it's trying to adjust everything to look a certain way and then the, the colors end up off and maybe that's yeah. something that's just going to take longer for it to learn how to do, but it's like not at that, like more than not. Like I had some, some people who came back and said, Oh, it works fine for me, but it depends on what they're shooting. And those people who are shooting like corporate headshots where they have very, yes, they have very controlled, controlled conditions, can very controlled conditions. It's very basic. It's not like you're trying to be like super creative with them. Like you want, and you want a very sort of like, standard lighting and everything every photo is kind of the same like and like you're doing that's the whole point is you want to do like the same sort of setup for everybody and you're like if you're editing you just shoot like 200 people for headshots and you're like okay i gotta edit a bunch of these all right you know once i get my final uh shot from each person and then it costs me 10 bucks to edit 200 individual headshots and okay we're done and that's it. And the batch process those, I can see it as something there as opposed to with a wedding or if I'm delivering a thousand pictures and it's costing me 50 bucks, Mm -hmm. but it's like, it's not, I'm going to have to go back and adjust things after it's already edited because I'm not getting the colors that I want. And then it's, I don't think it's for me, it wouldn't be something that I would, jump into as far as yeah it is that for the creative stuff like i'm thinking about like i I do a concert photography as well and sometimes when i'm editing those photos like i could not explain to you why why it's done when it's done like i look at it and i'm like this feels right this feels like how i felt at the concert right and also you've got the light like light is such a uh such a huge deal like especially yeah. at concerts where you get like different colored lights and sometimes you're like shooting them cause there's like, you know, the dust or whatever. Like you see get the light beams and you're trying like, even though that like the colors aren't quote unquote good mm-hmm. uh, for whatever, but it's like that you're going for the atmosphere yeah. of the, of the shot. Like, you know, and it's not some perfectly lit portrait. So yeah. Yeah. And I also fear that like obviously the worst case scenario is you use something like this, you send the photos to a client and the client is like, "Oh, I don't like these look like not like your stuff or these look edited by AI or something like that." Right? You would yeah. I definitely wouldn't want that to happen. So Yeah, I I tried one that was available online and it was do it like for portraits. Mm-hmm. That it would have, go through your portraits and like, "Oh, it's going to we're going to it's going to brighten the eyes a little bit and it's going to smooth the skin, whatever. And it was the funny thing that I found was it made people's eyes bigger. Hmm. Like it hit like just slightly larger. And it's like, Oh, it's going to, you know, but because it somehow thought that that was preferred, like people have like larger eyes. Well, that was your fault. You were using the anime. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I was using the big eyes. Whatever that, the, that movie what they call that kawaii away or whatever. There's a word for that. Uh, well, there was a woman who did those paintings. Mm. Uh, they did a movie about her with, I think it was Helena Bonham Carter called big eyes. Like she would do like, and her husband took credit for them for a very long time. Okay. But she just like drew the, like these children and animals. They had like these like very spooky big eyes and people were like, I'm just drawn to them. They look weird, but she was just like, Oh, I just like that. And, um, I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe this is like the anime thing. Maybe whatever yeah. it's, but, Just, uh, that'll be the new trend. Everyone looks like a Furby for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, no, thanks. See, you asked me how old I was. I'm, I'm old the enough Furby, to understand old, what a Furby is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was that? The, the animated movie that was a few years ago, some of the, against the machines, like all of the machines rose up and were like attacking humankind 
and event, like, uh, Mitchell versus Mitchell's versus the machines. And like they get into the mall and it's the, the giant Furby. And I was just like, Oh, this is bringing back nightmares from my youth. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I think that, uh, calling would be, is, is a much more automated process that AI could be good at. I feel like editing. I think so. It's just like, it, it, we are all, we are all individuals, um, as photographers and, you know, we're not all going for the exact same thing. And yeah. even while it can, like there, there are too many variables in any one photograph, unless, like I said, you're doing, uh, portraits like group, maybe, maybe for like also like school portraits, yeah, like doing school pictures yeah. Yeah. where, where, where bulk is just a whole other thing like you know, editing those photos totally get it um as totally. opposed to having to you know spend all that time or to pay somebody to do that if you're just especially if you're just getting into it um, yeah yeah even with the calling i'd be so interested to see how it actually like which ones it actually picks i think i will eventually try it like i'm gonna do like, it on like a i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah. go out and like do like a test shoot yeah and then try it because you can try it for free for i think a month on the yeah. calling because, you know, even with like framing and stuff like that, or, you know, what you were saying to straighten the horizon and all of these things, cropping and straightening, like sometimes a photo is better because the, the angles the off. Comp- or the composition's <laughs> weird, right? Yeah. And you just like that and you go, oh, again, it's more of that thing of like, it's not technically right, but it feels right or whatever. You yeah. Know? I don't know. I get it. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's, it's your artistic choice. And there's the thing that, you know, I talk about, talk about like out of focus pictures before yeah. and i got into a discussion with somebody about like uh intention fair yeah. yeah it's intention and editing and then taking the pictures and just this whole thing of i'm going to take out of focus pictures of people because that's a trend mm-hmm. or whatever like no like if you do something that's out of focus intentionally like there's a reason you want bl- motion blur or something like i have also chosen some photos that were just slightly out of focus from weddings because i was just like the emotional content of this is far outweighs the technical perfection of it or there was like a shot i did of a couple is dancing in the middle of the dance floor and they're slightly blurred because there's a long exposure but like all the people around them are really blurred um i'm like this is great this is i, I this is what i was going for but yeah it actually came out better than i had anticipated um yeah but yeah, that's, that's intentionally blurred. And I think that you, that'd be something you have to keep an eye out for in, you know, automatic AI culling. But yeah, I'm going to check it out and see how it, how it chooses, um, what's over. And I think that that's also just when it comes down to it, as far as the expense, it's not that much in the long run, as far as like how much time you could save yourself over the, the course of a year and get that back into either shooting more doing your marketing whatever it is just getting more time reclaiming more of your time um, in the long run yeah totally it's another option for a lot of things and uh you know you could just hire somebody to call your photos for you as well but that can get very very expensive right and maybe you don't agree with how they're calling it either so yeah yeah and i think that also the you know i haven't we haven't really been talking about it this much because it's more of a video related thing but you see like these ai video editing stuff like making uh matting like putting masking your like things in your videos a lot easier like that's a very usually a very time consuming process um which i hope make technical process yeah yeah, i think that hopefully that will make it easier for filmmakers or video people to like do better things Uh, um i think that that's a a valid use of that technology and on that note, we get into AI artwork. Cool. Because um, there's a lot to be said about AI art. Um, and there's the, the big ones are, you know, like Mid Journey, uh, Stable Diffusion, Dolly 2. Um, and again, I'll include links to all this stuff in the episode notes. Um, this stuff has just kind of gone crazy in the last year. Mm hmm. There's, it's overrun your streams of like uh, of every, whatever social media around like that lens of 
Yeah. 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 Um, it was nuts there for a couple of weeks. Everybody's like, oh, I'm going to spend my $15. And then like TikTok basically came out with a, like a free, <laughs> it was like very similar to the lens of thing, but there's like, there's so much to be said about, uh, AI art as far as like, how does it learn? And where is it learning all of this information from? Is it taking from other artists mm-hmm. is one of the big questions. Like there was a whole thing with mid journey, um, like three separate times in the last year, artists who died the next day, there were hundreds of thousands of queries into the mid journey engine mm. to create art in the style of that artist. Mm. Like they're like, okay, are you, they're taking advantage of the fact that this person is no longer alive to duplicate their work in some yeah. way. Yeah, that is, uh, that's a tough one. Have you used any of these things? Like, have you experimented yeah. with uh, Mid Journey? So yeah, like maybe talk about that, I guess. Yeah, and it's, the thing is like, y- y- it's surprisingly easy. Yeah. It, it to, like, it, it, the learning curve is not steep mm-hmm. to create things. And once you start to figure out that the more detailed your prompt is, yeah, yeah, yeah. The closer to what you're going for. And I, I see like in basically in Photoshop groups, people who combine the two, like they will take either. Uh, what I like to see is people taking content that is theirs. Yes. yes taking a photo yes. that is theirs. Yeah. Running it through like mid journey or stable diffusion yeah. with a prompt and then working on that, like what it's created and then doing other things with it and like, painting in or doing stuff to it afterwards that I find quite interesting and amazing what people can do. It's when you start seeing the very, uh, very similar, uh, returns that people are getting like, on yeah. there's, there's one in the, one of the, I sent you like a few links of like various artwork in there. One of them had a yep. Dante's Inferno. I think mm-hmm, it was like mm-hmm, a, looked mm-hmm. like a painting. Mm hmm very much in the style of some fantasy artists that, yeah. I, that, that you see. And it's, uh, I saw probably in the beginning of this use of AI art, uh, in the last year, I saw hundreds of images that looked exactly like that, that style. Like, right. you, so you've got all of these people putting in like specific prompts like about things and getting very similar artwork back, which what's happening here is, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's leaning heavily on somebody, something that's learned yeah, and thinks that people like, uh, but also just the use of a prompt, like in the style of that's yeah, that's dubious for sure. Yeah. I've, I've played around with uh, one of these. It's called Dream uh, by Wombo. So the reason why I liked that one, I think at the top, like I got into the, the kind of had my whole arc <laughs> with the AI art thing with like right when it started to get popular. And then I got like super obsessed with it for like a couple of weeks. And then I stopped caring about it almost entirely until you brought me <laughs> brought me on the podcast. <laughs> but uh, with Dream, like, yeah, you enter the prompts, right? Like you can say, I want... Uh, panda bear eating ice cream uh and he has claws like wolverine or whatever and like it'll it'll do that for you and then you can put um like a source image like you were saying right so i would like take a photo one really cool one i did was like i took a photo of me and my dad and then i said uh batman and his dad in the bat cave and it like did me up like batman and did my dad up kind of like batman and i was like that's interesting. That's really cool. It kind of gave me that, like, I don't know if you've ever done a lot of, uh, like actual drawing or painting or anything. Like, have you done that type of stuff? No good. (laughs) Not good at that. Yeah. (laughs) Makes sense. That's why you got into the photography. I've tried. It just doesn't work for me. (laughs) No, that's fair. Um, you get a very specific type of buzz from doing that type of stuff. Like, uh, like a buzz in your brain, like a kind of a high from, 
creating art, I'm sure you get a similar thing when you're editing photos or shooting photos, that creative buzz. And I was getting that by playing with these apps, right? And I was kind of feeling like what I was creating. I even sometimes would like draw something with pastels, right? And then feed that in and then take like that stuff, put it in Photoshop, cut it all up, make a collage, and then put it back into the AI and see what it does. Yeah, see, like, that's it, way it more creative. It's pretty creative, creative yeah. man. Yeah. I think yeah. there is in my problems with yeah. this one of the big ones is where is it learning from and there are like lawsuits I, I he would sent me a link to a lawsuit against stable diffusion i had not um been able to take a look at that before we recorded but yep. there's i a can there's a I lot can break of that down if you sure. want sure uh yeah I, do you want me to get into that now sure the lawsuit okay cool yeah so this video that uh that i sent you um i actually found this on youtube a while ago put it in the old watch later didn't really have a reason to watch it until today so thank you for for <laughs> that uh corridor crew it's called lawyer explains uh, the stable diffusion lawsuit so as you're saying with these um like the data sets uh the one that stability ai and i believe mid journey uses as well uh, is the Lion uh, 5B data set, which is basically just like 6 billion, <laughs> nearly 6 billion copyrighted illustrations um, <laughs> that are just taken from the internet, like, you know, what whatever, uh, DeviantArt and all these different yeah. Instagram, all these different sites where people post their art, right? Uh, without, you know, the, the artists are, have no say in this. So I've created some digital art. It's probably in these data sets, right? I've done some of my own original comments comics and blah, 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 very likely like something that I've created or even photos that you've taken could be considered part of these data sets, right? So that's, uh, there's actually two lawsuits now that I know of, and this is an evolving thing. By the time this podcast comes out, there'll probably be more. Um, one of them is a class action lawsuit uh, in the District Court of California. So that would be like applying, obviously, like American copyright law. Uh, and the other one, Getty Images is suing them in the UK, uh, specifically suing uh, Stability AI, who makes uh, stable stable diffusion or whatever. Um, yeah, so the whole thing will come down to you know this like uh, is it is this actually transforming the art? Is this a new way of using? Like, is this something different than just is it transformative? Art? Yeah, is it transformative or is it just like I guess uh, like a derivative of the original art? Um, yeah, and that's something to think about. And I think there's also there was also some some questions I, also with Lenza, which was the app that a lot of people were using to get like profile pics, like mm -hmm. AI created profile pics. Their data set included um, photos of uh, medical, like medical photos of people. Mm -hmm. Um, nice. which is why the eyes in a lot of things didn't work really well um, because they were dead eyes. Um, wow. There's uh, there were like other things that were included in their data set that were like the ethical questions that you're bringing up outside of just like copyright. Right. Were, yeah. Should you be using this? Like, should this image be able, should you be able to use this as part of your data set? Um, and there were kind of, there's a lot of like ethically gray areas but like what you're talking about there is and why these lawsuits are going to exist is like, yeah, I have a friend who's just so into mid journey and he just creates, he'll create movies like, like stills from a movie, like a different, like uh, he'll switch the time period in which it was shot and who directed it. Mm -hmm. Like he'll be like, what if Christopher Nolan directed uh casino in the 1970s? And then you'll see like, it'll produce all of these different images and you're just like the, the, the way that it, it like it, there's nothing specific or, or star Wars. One, I think one you did was star Wars directed by uh, Wes Anderson. And mm -hmm. it's like these, and it's, you're looking at going, Oh, that's funny. And then you go like, start going like, wait, where are they getting these faces from? And one of the things is if you're doing any of these apps, and you're putting your image into it, that's probably, they're getting your face. Uh, your face is becoming part of the data set. I hate to break it to you. Um, but a lot of these things, when we were talking about, hey, they're going to steal your soul uh, with your photo. Like they're starting to do it in a way. They're still definitely stealing your appearance. You're, you're using filters on TikTok. <laughs> like either they're taking your image and throwing it into these data sets. Um, but it's this sort of like you're creating artwork 
in the style of somebody else, it's not just the, like, you're just kind of like doink. It, it, the level, the, the bar has mm-hmm. been lowered so far for entry. Yeah. It kind of makes me think of Jurassic Park. Yeah. When, when Jeff Goldblum's like, you're standing on the shoulders of giants mm. and you didn't think you, you only thought about like what you could do with it and not should you do it. Yeah. And there's just sort of this like, Oh, we're just going to like open this up and everybody can use this. So now there's just like everybody, like I'm going to create, you know, right. This art, like where you see these artists, when you're talking about DV, the stuff that I just like stole from deviant art, basically like I was seeing all these things. I'm like, wait, I've seen this before. And I'm like going back to like deviant art and going like, this is like so-and-so style. This is like their, those very electro electric, like Tronish looking like sci-fi yeah. images. And you're just like, Oh, they just like yanked this guy's style right. and, and make, let people make their own stuff with it. And like, you could always do that. You could always look up some shit on DeviantArt and rip it off. Right. right. Like I could, I could see a photo that you took a, a, a nice uh, wedding photo that I see on your Instagram. And then I'm shooting a wedding and I'm like, man, I'm going to recreate that shit. Casey did. Right. Yeah. And I, anyone could always do that. It was always kind of a, maybe, you know, artistically in, in terms of your artistic integrity, maybe that was a wrong thing to do. But like you're saying, now the technology has made it so easy that I could rip off Casey a, a million times a day and just enter little prompts, right? Yeah. In the style of, yeah. Right. And it's just like, you know, there's one thing to be said, like, oh, I'm going to learn how to do something similar to what this person did. Mm-hmm. I'm going to like, I'm going to learn the skills. Right. Yeah. To make something like this. I'm going to learn how to light this photo this way, or I'm going to learn the skills of how to draw this. Like now I don't have to be able to draw at all. No. Yeah. Like I can just say like, Oh, I want to do this blah, blah, blah in the style of Dolly. And all of a sudden I've got, you know, my own little Dolly painting. I'm like, Oh, I created a Dolly painting. No, you didn't. The computer created the Dolly painting. Like by looking at Dolly's images, like his, his artwork. Um, and a lot of those things, like a lot of that, like the, this, also makes the question things like the Metropolitan Museum of Arts entire um, collection is in the public domain. Mm, okay. So it can go in there and like, I'm sure it goes into there and be like, blah, 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 blah. we're going to learn all of our like masters, like the, the, you know, the Dutch masters and all of those things. And then you can be able to create artwork in the style of, you know, these people. And, and it's, but you've yeah lowered the bar for creation of Mm -hmm. quote unquote artwork so far that there's like almost very little work involved. And like people are, you've got people, like I said, I I have, I know people who like just do this all the time who are not artists. Yeah. I like how you took the, that, so you can break that up, you know, the term artwork, you just said there's not very much work involved, right? Is there very much art involved though? Right. It's the art is on the other side where it's, being taken from it's the data set that's being taken from uh maybe but i don't know like you could make the argument like that this isn't necessarily what i believe but you could make the argument that the you know if it comes to oh what is art well what about (laughs) it's the the meaning the the intention right the kind of conversation between the the artist and the person who's seeing it you could say that someone who is assembling like ai art or creating those prompts is an artist because you could just as much as anybody else creating any type of image, you can put meaning into an image. You could say, Oh, um, you know, my prompt is going to be, I want a picture of, uh, Colonel Sanders and Jesus. And they're in like (laughs) a knife fight with a bunch of chickens all watching, cheering it on. Right. right. And it's a stupid, (laughs) stupid example, but those are all, um, symbols with meaning. And someone could look at that and and say, Oh, well, this is, a." this piece of artwork is a criticism of capitalism or it's a comment on uh, religion or animal rights, whatever the hell you want to say. Right. That could be a piece of art that could provoke thought that could. Right. So. Yeah. But then you see, like I sent you that uh, Petapixel article, Victorian people who never existed. So cool. They're so cool. It's really cool. And you're like, Oh man, this is amazing. Then you start to go like, Oh wait, uh, these people never existed. Like there's a, there's a start to to think about like, what, how could this be used against people? Like in a sort of, um, propaganda ish sort of way is another thing where I'm like, 
oh man, this kind of like you could get people going like, well, this is what happened. Or there was the there's the ones that that really boggled my mind. We're on another one of the links that I sent you. There was like 1970s New York City, like film grain gritty blah 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 daytime whatever and you're seeing these shoots and i'm like this looks real like a historical yeah photo yeah this is scary this is like this is really frightening and um that that worries me in a, in a way like how are we going to be able to determine in the future because right now one of the things that it really can't do very well eyes and hands like it doesn't do hands. They don't do hands real well. Like if people end up with like eight or nine fingers. <laughs> or lobster claws. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like everything everywhere all at once. Like hot yeah. dog fingers. <laughs> photos. Uh, so it's like always the thing that I look for first is I look for hands. And eyes, it's like starting to, they're starting to do eyes better. Um, but they all, the, the eyes tend to like have a weird look to them. Dead eyes, like you said. Yeah. 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 And <laughs> there was, speaking of data sets, there, I don't know if you're on TikTok at all, but there was a there was one that was going around like this free one on on uh, TikTok, and everybody was going, "Oh, that's doesn't like it doesn't look anything like me, like it doesn't look anything like me." And I was like, I did it a few times. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't look. Why doesn't it look like me? What's wrong here? And f- figuring out like I have blue eyes, and none of them came out with blue eyes. And I was looking at the facial features. And I'm like, oh, this was done in like India. Like the data set is very much South Asian, darker complexions because everybody looks a little darker. The hair is always dark. Everybody has brown eyes. Um, and I was just like, oh, yeah, white people are doing this and going, this looks nothing like me because it doesn't look like white people. And you're not part of the data set for this. Mm. And so like, there was a whole question of how, like, oh, how does that make you feel to be left out? Uh, there's sort of a reverse thing here. But also it teaches you, like, wh- where you are not welcome and you are not part of the norm. Um, but also it, it like, shows you it's very, you know, evidence of where is this coming from? It's like, where is the the source material that's being used and uh, if it doesn't like you're you're not going to get the results that you quote unquote want yeah if you don't have the source material to work from that that matches there's, up yeah there's always like evidence of whatever in whatever you create with these type of tools there's evidence of that data set in it right like the original thing yeah and it's just sort of a i don't know like i think i think that what you were discussing about like people who like i have a lot more respect and i have seen a lot of this there are a lot of people I know there's the photographers I know who have taken like photos that they've shot like portraits and like, I'm going to use AI to like use this to like make this something different, make it a painting or make it like whatever. And they're using their own images as, as the source material. And also like, you know, like creating really interesting stuff, like using their own artwork, their original content to create something new or to use it to inspire what, what is my next thing going to be? Like I kind of have some words rolling around in my head and they're not using it commercially. They're not using whatever, like the AI, like when they're just like typing something in and like, I want to do some blah, blah, blah. Like they want to look at something. They want to get a vision board yeah. for something to create. And I think that that's, you know, that's a great way of doing stuff. Um, when we get into the photorealistic, I think this is like, sort of the last <clears throat> part of this to cover for right now, mm-hmm. when you get into, is this going to put photographers out of work? Mm-hmm. Like when you look at the stock photography stuff that they're able to do with this now, like a year ago, I would have been like, Oh, there's going to be some, like it's, you're going to be able to tell, yeah. but there are like images now where I'm just, and you can be super specific like one of the ones that I sent you was uh, a turtle wearing a space helmet, whatever. And it looks real. It looks like, like somebody brought in like an actual turtle, but like put this thing together and I'm sure they spend some time on it, but it's like when they can use these tools to create exactly the photo they want mm-hmm. and they don't have to pay anybody to do it and it looks real that is going to you know change 
things. I think especially when it comes to, uh, as the, as it gets better with people and there are already, um, 3d models of people like AI models. Yeah. That you can feed into some of these things and like get them to do like put them in certain positions and things like that. It's going to change a lot of stuff. Um, as far as, um, stock photography, product photography, um, the, unfortunately, like, I think that's gonna, I, and I've seen, like, I was initially skeptical of like what the output of this was going to be, but I, mm-hmm. what's her name? Karen Cheng. Uh, she's real popular on Instagram. She always creates like these crazy, she's the one who like, oh, I'm at the San Francisco, I'm at the Golden Gate Bridge and you can't use a drone here. how did I make this drone shot? And she's like using a like super Swif- Swiffers. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, like it's really super long like pole or whatever in there yeah. or thinking about a fishing line, stuff like that. Yeah. And she's like, she comes up with like these like really kind of ingenious, um, ways of creating stuff without actually using, um, what you would think to create it, uh, getting a crane shot without a crane. Um, but she worked on a cover, like a, a magazine cover that they created. And they were like, okay, we're going to create a magazine cover of an astronaut, on an alien planet, you know, doing like, like I can't remember what the exactly the prompt was, but like they worked on it and like got it down. And I was like, when I saw the final image, I was just like, holy shit, that looks like a photograph. Mm-hmm. And when you can do that without creating, like having to go do sets, getting yeah. models and, uh, props and, whatever is this becomes a much more thing. This is going to like budget is always a thing where they're like, Oh, we don't want to spend money on this. And if it looks real and they can get away with, you know, having a, like you've got your, whoever your creative director is and maybe a couple of computer artists who are able to like manage like this and get it into a place where it works. Yeah, I, I think that that becomes problematic for photographers in the future. For sure. I think that's the story with every, like, every thing that evolves with technology, people are going to get put out of work, right? I mean, when cars got invented, that put a lot of horses out of work. Or <laughs> if if you want to take that to, to you know, all of these horses, they're really upset about it. Um, you want to take that to, to like, art, a, a good example with like art itself when you know cgi came out like cgi animation toy story and that shit that put a lot of hand-drawn animators out of work as well i don't know how you can say okay well this is where we're gonna stop like we've technology like technology has progressed we've (laughs) used these tools to to tell our stories uh you know to convey information to convey how we feel about the world to relate to each other we're going to stop here because this is too much technology. Like I'm not comfortable with doing that, but I do get what you're saying. It, it will, it's definitely going to put some people out of work. It yeah, it's going, will. it's going to change the landscape for sure. I'm not yeah. saying it's, I'm not saying it's not going to happen or we should like, we need to put the brakes on all of this immediately. I think the ethical questions need to be asked. Yeah. Like where's the, where are we getting the data from? Like that needs to be more transparent. Yeah. And yeah. people need to be compensated if they're, artwork is being well sold commercially (laughs) is like what about this like when we're talking about these uh you you know specifically like the ai generation the the tools where you're generating images and they're using a data set well what if the artist had to opt into that and then it got tracked what stuff and they got paid yeah that's a different conversation yeah i think that would be a useful conversation to have i think that's definitely something that, that, that should be considered because you're like looking at these like I said, there were artists who had passed away who had been quite popular and now they're gone and they're like, Oh, we're going to like teach mid journey to create artwork in their style. Like the next day, like, and they're saying that like, this is the developers. This is not like people out there in the world creating like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of prompts. Yeah. In, in a matter of an hour, like the next day, like this is, this was not, queries from just users like mm-hmm. there's there was just the the amount of because they have to publish i think like w- certain amount of like how it's learning 
And like people were just like mm-hmm. going through that and like finding these queries. I'm like, this seems like you're teaching it to do like this person's art because they mm-hmm. just died and you're looking to capitalize on the ability to recreate their artwork that that I've got a problem with for sure. Yeah. There's going to be like a new, you know, there's going to be new laws that'll have to come out to deal with this stuff and just new, new, like norms and new, uh, I don't know, new, like forms of like artistic morality or whatever. Like you wouldn't just blatantly rip off someone's photos or you wouldn't blatantly rip off someone's art. And why would you do that through like using a different tool? All of a sudden it's okay. Like, yeah, people need to, I don't know. We're going to need to adjust like our thinking and stuff like that as the technology changes, I suppose. Right. Yeah. It's going to be a real interesting conversation. Do you have your own website? Are you tired of dealing with slow loading pages and poor support from your current web hosting company? Consider switching to SiteGround, the top-rated web hosting company that provides 24-7 support and super-fast hosting speeds. SiteGround's platform is built on the premium Google Cloud infrastructure, ensuring top reliability, security, and speed for your website. Their fast network and storage provide optimal site speed and a high level of redundancy, so you can trust that your website will be up and running smoothly at all times. With SiteGround's ultra-fast server setup, your pages will load 30% faster on average, giving your visitors a better user experience and improving your website's SEO. And with hosting starting from just $1.99 per month, it's affordable for any budget. Plus, if you're not completely satisfied, SiteGround offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. Don't suffer with a terrible web hosting company any longer. Make the switch to SiteGround and experience top-level support, super-fast hosting, and a reliable, secure platform for your website. I spent years with a web hosting company that was absolutely terrible. My site was constantly getting hacked and support was nearly impossible to get a hold of. Since switching to SiteGround, all of those problems are in the past. Just visit nerdyphotographer.com slash recommends slash SiteGround or click the link in the episode notes to get started and begin enjoying faster, more reliable web hosting today. Hey, 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 and now for my favorite part of the show, what's that say? Useless information. Ugh, this is always death. <laughs> so, Jared, if if the sun exploded, it would take eight minutes for us to know that it happened. Yeah, okay, cool. I can while, wrap my head around that. While the shockwave itself wouldn't hit us that fast, it would take eight minutes for us to see it because of the speed of light. Yeah. Um, we, we wouldn't know that it happened for eight minutes. How does that make you feel? Uh, that makes me feel like I have a base level understanding of relativity, which <laughs> makes me feel like a, like a real clever person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I sort of like find those sort of topics sort of putting us in our place cosmically. Yeah. Like, you mm-hmm. know, you're a wonderful thing. You're amazing to to be here living and conscious and knowing yeah. what's going on. But we're also just tiny, tiny little specks. But and how many YouTube videos would come out in that time that the sun actually hasn't exploded? It's a government conspiracy. These, <laughs> they'd be these, shorts. Yeah. They, they'd be definitely be shorts. <laughs> they'd, be shorts. <laughs> they'd be reels on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're no, no longer than 15 seconds. <laughs> Jared, thank you very much for coming on again. Where can people find you? Oh, I'm so glad that you asked. Uh, If you guys like my uh, opinions and my ideas and you want to hear me talk about photography for hours on end, uh, (laughs) I've got my own podcast, the uh, Photography Friends podcast. Uh, It's great. We uh, we have wonderful guests. Even Casey's been on there before. So, yeah, you guys can find his episode. And they can find you on the Instagram at... Was, well, of course. Of course they can find me on Instagram. <laughs> Where you're creating reels. Photo uh, underscore friends underscore pod. I've got, a, I've got a reel out right now where I'm actually doing a photography rap. Uh, Is that the, yours? I mean, that's, I mean, did you do that? Where did you get the source that's audio? All, that's just me rapping, man. That's Dude, rapping. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a... <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use your audio. I'm going to try to... Go ahead, make, give you some viral baby. viral audio <laughs> well creator. i need to get it on tiktok i think that's really the key so yeah, yeah i mean give me like definitely are you on tiktok not yet no 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 okay well give me the audio and we can get it on tiktok all right we'll make it happen yeah sounds good man thanks for coming on
Of course. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you found this discussion on artificial intelligence and photography informative and thought-provoking. Many thanks to Jared Poitier for coming on the show. Be sure to check the episode notes for Jared's links and give a listen to the Photo Friends podcast. Also, like I said before, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this show, the Nerdy Photographer podcast, and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or pretty much anywhere you can leave a review for a podcast. But Apple Podcasts really helps us the most because it helps us reach new listeners. You can also follow along on social media at the nerdy photo on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. That's at the nerdy photo. Lots of fun stuff always happening on the socials. You can also find other totally free ways to help support the podcast in the episode notes. JCN, I have to say first, I am very impressed with the fully functioning robotic arms and hands that you built for yourself since the opening. And second, this is some of the best guacamole I've ever eaten. The party smart is 42. Perfectly ripe. Avocados. Yeah, trust me, I know that is a difficult search. Until next time, everybody, stay safe and stay nerdy. Do you enjoy listening to your entertainment? Why am I asking? You're doing it right now. You must. With Audible, you can enjoy all of your audio entertainment in one place. From bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, mysteries and thrillers, motivation, wellness, business, and more. Audible has an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre. But that's not all. Audible also offers exclusive Audible originals from top celebrities, renowned experts, and exciting new voices in audio. Plus thousands of podcasts from popular favorites to exclusive new series. And with the Audible app, it's easy to listen anytime, anywhere. Whether you're out taking photographs of landscapes, editing pictures in your studio, or going on intergalactic adventures with the Nerdy Photo Crew, you can listen to your favorite audiobooks and podcasts wherever you want. Right now, I'm going through Frank Herbert's Dune Saga once again. The world of these books is so rich and deep with history, I come back over and over and over. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. So what are you waiting for? Go to audibletrial.com slash nerdyphoto and sign up for Audible today and discover your next favorite listen. That's audibletrial.com slash nerdyphoto.